Um, a very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the ISA's Pathfinder Lecture on Sri Lanka's economic imperatives, creating a compelling investment climate. Before we proceed with the event, I would appreciate if you could mute your microphones and switch off your videos throughout the session. If you have any questions or feedback to share, please forward them via the chat to the moderator. The questions will be consolidated for the panelists to answer. This afternoon, we are happy to have with us the distinguished guest speaker, Mr. Sanjaya Mohatala, Director General, Board of Investment, Sri Lanka, Dr. Amitendu Palit, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead, Trade and Economics, ISAS, will moderate the panel discussion. I now invite Dr. Palit to deliver the opening remarks. Dr. Palit, please. Thank you so much, Roshni. Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the second Institute of South Asian Studies Pathfinder Foundation Colombo webinar. And today we are going to discuss in a nutshell the economic prospects and the imperative of creating a positive and conducive investment climate for a country which has tremendous economic and business prospects and is ready to go at a time when it has just completed its latest general elections. I would like to very briefly share with you, for those of you who may not be fully aware of the Institute of South Asian Studies, I first apologize for Professor Raja Mohan not being able to be with us for this event today. The Institute of South Asian Studies is a part of the National University of Singapore. We were set up in the year 2004. We are one of the six autonomous research institutes of the National University of Singapore. We study contemporary South Asia across a broad range of verticals, research verticals that can be divided into trade and economics, domestic politics, foreign policy and security issues, technology policies, and also diaspora issues. Our work cuts across a wide spectrum of policy research as apart from being a part of the National University of Singapore, we are funded by the ministries of foreign affairs and trade and industry of the government of Singapore. For us, it is important to look at South Asia's engagement with various parts of the world, but more specifically, Southeast Asia and the regions or spaces that are around the South Asian region to track the variety of developments that are happening, as well as study their implications in as deep-rooted and multifaceted a fashion as possible. In this respect, Sri Lanka is an extremely important country for focus as far as the ISAS is concerned. We not only try to look at Sri Lanka in terms of the variety of developments that are happening in this particular country from a political, foreign policy and economic perspective, but we are also keen on looking at Sri Lanka in a more generic regional influence and agenda setting capacity, particularly in terms of its role in the Indian Ocean, greater South Asian development and integration between South Asia and the Southeast Asian part of the world. To that extent, it's been a pleasure for us to work with the Pathfinder Foundation. We had this joint webinar series kicked off in the month of September, where Jayant Kolumbage, the Foreign Secretary, had addressed a distinguished group of participants in the first of the events. And today we are very happy to have another very distinguished speaker joining us. Let me, without uh, further ado, uh, also welcome two very distinguished dignitaries that we have 
as part of our distinguished participants today. The first of these, Her Excellency Sri Lankan High Commissioner, Sashikala Premabhathane, and also the High Commissioner of Singapore to Sri Lanka, Mr. S. Chandradas, a board member of the ISAS. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome, sir, to the program. We are delighted to have you with us. Let me now have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Mr. Sanjay Mohatala assumed duties as Director General of the Board of Investment of Sri Lanka, the Investment Promotion Agency of the Government of Sri Lanka, earlier this year in the month of March 2020. Mr. Mohatala is a Bachelor of Science in Electronic and Telecommunication Engineering and is also a Management Accountant. He holds a postgraduate qualification in marketing and is a Fulbright Scholar. And he completed his Master of Business Administration degree in Entrepreneurship and Strategy at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. Mr. Mohatala had worked for Unilever Sri Lanka as a brand manager and subsequently joined the Boston Consulting Group, a leading global management consultant company, where he served as the managing director and partner. Since March this year, in addition to serving the Board of Investment in Sri Lanka as its director general, he's also serving as a board member at the Sri Lankan Airlines and the Sri Lanka Export Development Board, and as part of Sri Lanka's Economic Revival Task Force. Before I invite Mr. Sanjay Mohatada to have the floor, let me also request you to kindly keep your microphones on mute while the speaker addresses the participants. Mr. Mohatala will be speaking for roughly 30 minutes. After that, we will be having an extensive engagement with him through a variety of questions which we are expecting to have on the chat forum. With that, Mr. Mohatala, a great pleasure to have you here with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Pali, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you, thank you for having me as the second speaker uh, for this webinar, joint webinar between uh, ISS and uh, Pathfinder. Uh, in terms of Sri Lanka point of view, uh, uh, following the discussion that you all had with um, uh, Admiral Columbia, Professor Admiral Columbia, uh, it is a pertinent topic in terms of uh, how would we unleash a decade of growth uh, in line with the ambitions that were set forth by the president himself. Um, as Dr. Palit mentioned, the Sri Lankan people have spoken and given a resounding to the majority to the current government. To bring about the change that the president uh, put forth in his manifest uh, when he ran for, uh, ran for presidency uh, over a year ago. Um, along with that, uh, of course, COVID has not really helped us in terms of achieving our goals in a speedy manner. But having said that, uh, there has been a sea change that's been taking place in Sri Lanka to be able to position our country uh, to achieve that ambition. So one such change is uh, many individuals from private sector, including me, coming and taking on positions in Sri Lanka, try to help uh, the policy agenda and also the reforms agenda that the, uh, the president has put forward. Uh, in addition, I think if I think about my institution, the WI, there have been two notable changes uh, what the president has uh, made. One is in appointing the, the cabinet, uh, the minister of cabinet. Um, the, when you allocate the portfolios, the BO has been kept separately under the, under the stewardship of HE or the, uh, the president and elevated as an entity that provides direction to the entire country. And this is uh, including there are a few other entities just like the OI. Secondly, uh, he had created a cabinet subcommittee to be able to address any issues or any policy decisions that needed to facilitate investments in the country. So those are two big changes that had not happened in the past, I would say the past decade in the country. 
and I would say this is a, a right step in terms of getting the investments into the country. So in the 30 minutes allotted to me, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of where Sri Lanka is as an economy, some of the challenges we are facing, and how BOI, working with the government, trying to take some of these impediments out and also make Sri Lanka a uh, conducive investment, creating a conducive investment climate, and some of the sectors that we are prioritizing or pioneering to create inclusive growth in this country to make sure that in you know, 10 years, our vision of achieving 5 to 7 percent GDP is achieved. So in that light, I have a couple of slides which I will run through and uh, uh, we, I will limit the, the discussion for 30 minutes and then we can of course get into the Q&A afterwards. So uh, to sum up, the overall objective is to achieve uh, 6 to 7 percent GDP growth in the next 10 years uh, while managing uh, the balance of payments issues that the country is facing and also making sure that's an inclusive growth. So there's four critical components I feel that needs to come into play. One is we need to have a very conducive market environment, which I will go in detail. We need to have a right labor pool to be able to achieve and create the economy that we are looking at. We need to have a legal and regulatory framework um, to be able to address the changing uh, dynamics of the investments and the complexity of the investments we are seeing. And of course, we need to bring in the uh, enabling factors, uh, mostly the infrastructure we need. Uh, of course, uh, BOI, uh, working with the missions, the excellencies, we've been uh, spearheading a multi pronged approach uh, in terms of getting the capabilities we need and also uh, get targeting the right investments uh, we need for this country. We have prioritized a couple of sectors, which I will go through a little bit in detail as we get to that. Just to set the context where we are and why this journey matters now. In Sri Lanka has been an open economy since 1978. But if you look at the export basket that Sri Lanka has, it is predominantly weighted towards apparel. Beyond apparel, the most the other billion dollar export verticals have been with us for the longest time. Let it be whether it's tea or, or spices or, or agri-based uh, products, or whether it is rubber, which has been a, a country known for rubber for the longest time. Of course, beyond that, we do have a couple of billion dollar foreign exchange earners, which is the tourism and IT and so on and so forth. But the existing basket of exports, uh, we do face some of the challenges as a country, uh, whether it is apparel, whether it is the, the traditional uh, export basket. So it is really paramount for us to rethink how our country can export to the world and what sort of API that needs to come in to be able to enable that. So that's one of the starting points. Secondly, if you look at our performance in terms of FDI, if you look at the last five years, four to five years, the two things that, that is evident. One is if you look at the y-axis, you will see that the, the, the countries from where the FDI money flows out has changed. It's not traditionally what it used to be where US, Europe being the major uh, blocks of FDI. It's actually the Middle East. It's, it's uh, North Asia, China, Japan, Hong Kong, Thailand. Those are the countries who are actually creating most of the FDI outflows. And if you look at the FDI inflows in terms of capture, unfortunately, our country, Sri Lanka, has not fared well uh, compared to our regional peers. Now, why is this strategy of getting the FDIs or setting a stage for decade of growth is so paramount? If this is just a graph just explaining from 2000 onwards. Uh, uh, y axis has all the exports in billion dollars, and uh, on the x axis, you have the years. And of course, you have covered a couple of countries Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. If you look at these countries, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia has had a much more proactive approach in terms of getting the exports. If you look at Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, we start at the same point. While Sri Lankan economy has grown to about $4,000 per GDP, I expose to GDP ratio has remained very low, and our exports basket has been uh, very skewed. Now, why is this point matters? When a country goes through $4,000 to $6,000 GDP per capita, those I call them in the formative years of a country. Unless you get the economic policies right, and if you don't build the trust industries at that point, the country would not see a rapid growth, but you would see a fluttered growth uh, in the years to come. So this is very critical given where Sri Lanka's starting point to get that economic policy right. Now, 
if you ask what had happened historically or what was the reason why we have not been able to get the investment that needed for this country, of course, some of these, change, some of these challenges are common to income. And just to highlight some of the things that I feel we need to debottleneck, per se, uh, to get the investments into this country. There are four categories I look at, market environment, labor force, uh, legal environment, and of course, the enabling factor. So let's just do a quick comparison in terms of the regional peers and where we stand. Meaning Vietnam has 26 free trade agreements, Sri Lanka have lacks in our free trade agreements, though we have a sort of a bilateral trade understandings or uh, trade agreements, but we only do have three free trade agreements. Uh, there are challenges in terms of the bureaucracy. There is something that is common for many countries. There are villages in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, the island. The bureaucracy takes quite a long time for an investor to come in and set up in this country. There have been ad hoc changes to the policies. Uh, with every budget cycle, with every new government coming in, the policy consistency has not been there. Now, if you look at countries like Singapore, uh, with the stewardship of EDP, the economic policy and the economic investment climate and the, the policies to put into that has been uh, consistent over many years. Then on the labor force point of view, Meaning within the BOI today, um, there's 1,800 entities and close to about 500,000 people directly employed. But the skill set is quite skewed towards uh, uh, general but skilled labor in terms of apparel and so on and so forth. So if you think about where the country needs to head in the next five to 10 years, there's a, so there's a large aspect we need to think about what our workforce should be and the skill sets that we need to get. Uh, we need to think about our labor participation. Um, that is predominantly because most industries are around Colombo. With that, we see less women labor participation compared to some of the countries that we like, we aspire to be. And of course, um, that we need to address the geographical distribution of uh, the factories, uh, which are concentrated in the western province or western part of the country due to infrastructure and so on and so forth. Then, when you come to la labor framework, the labor framework. I could break it down into a couple of things. One is as a facilitating agency, uh, its powers, its vested within to be able to provide the, uh, the comfort or the protection that the investors need. Thirdly, secondly, it's about the supporting infrastructure or supporting the regulation, I would say. Whether it is the bankruptcy laws, whether it's the investment laws, whether it is the, uh, the laws around uh, labor, uh, whether around the bankruptcy, uh, cross-border trade. So these are some of these things has, which has to be uh, revised and brought, brought to uh, in terms of or make it more comparable with the, the rest of the countries that we have. In terms of the enabling uh, factor, factors point of view, uh, energy infrastructure is some of the, one of the challenges that the country has been facing. And that's something that uh, the president has put forward in terms, in terms of the, the the top gear in terms of addressing this, this as a priority. Then also looking at uh, industrial zones and uh, locations that we need to build uh, to house all these investors, investments coming into the country. Now, with all those, we have, we have an ambitious, uh, uh, ambitious goal, we have said, to move Sri Lanka towards a, a knowledge-based economy. So we've been moving from a factor-driven economy to a more investment-driven economy, and we are trying to be a more knowledge-based economy uh, by 2025. So if I just step back and sum up, we have a traditional export base. We have some of the challenges that we have been facing uh, for the couple of year, past couple of years, similar challenges where the other countries in the region has been also facing. Then we have ambitious growth plans, and of course, uh, complete economic trust that we're looking at moving or making knowledge basically. So to be able to do that, we need to take a transformative approach for both the government or in terms of the country, but also for the as the entity UI to make sure that we can deliver on that and provide the right support structure. So in terms of the country transformation or the country attractiveness to get investments, there are three big buckets I will get. One is the uh, creating a company investment climate. I will spend more time on this one, speaking in more detail in terms of what are the aspects that we need to do to be able to get the investors in. Second one is on, in the target sectors or the target sector that we are prioritizing, how do you create the 
a company investment climate for them to come and set up here. And of course, um, the third one, I would say about broadly creating a end-to-end -end investor climate, you call it more the farming of the investors when they're here to expand their uh, footprint and create a, uh, create a vibrant uh, economic uh, activity in the country. But if you look at the, the BOI point of view, there are three, four things that needs to change. One is the organization structure and empowering people because the mandate of the BOI in, uh, is changing over the years as well. The BOI in the back in the 1978 was set up predominantly to manage and encourage the low end of the manufacturing market. But today, BOI has been elevated and all government large scale projects are being funneled through BOI. In that situation, of course, our organization, the capabilities needs to step up to be able to handle these complex infrastructure and PPP projects and so on and so forth. Uh, as, as an entity and as a country, as the country embraces technology, uh, our organization needs to do, do the same to be able to provide a seamless uh, investment uh, process that the, our investors can follow. Of course, there's, then there is uh, the partnership that uh, we've been forming both with the local entities as well as the, the foreign governments and foreign uh, institutions to be able to strengthen that, uh, we call it, strengthen the, the knowledge pool, the talent pool, and also to put the country uh, in the right light uh, when you put in front of the investors. And of course, getting the model processes and the PMO right in terms of delivering all this for the country as well as in the organization. So if I think about the company investment climate, uh, we are looking at 10 strategic levers which needs to get addressed. And I would say this is the basis. If you get this right, the rest you can build on top of it with the foundation of the country. So within the market environment, there are three strategic pillars. Within labor, there are two regulatory, we are looking at three, and of course, enabling, there's another two more. So there's 10 strategic pillars. I'll go one by one just to give a quick sense of some of the big step changes we are trying to push, thereby enabling and creating this energy. Uh, in terms of strategic type trust and consistent policies, this is something that most of you all will see in the upcoming budget as well, uh, because we really need a consistent uh, long-term investment policies from the country uh, to be able to, uh, so the investors have a peace of mind uh, when they try to look, in, look at look in, to investing in the country. Uh, empowering a BOI, and to ensure the provisions contained within the agreements or the stantity of the agreement uh, are guaranteed for a stipulated period of time. And this is something that most of the time the investors, me coming from the private sector as well, tells me that with the changes in the law of the country, the, sometimes the agreements are not as, as robust as what they look to be when they entered into uh, a few years ago. And this is a challenge many countries are facing. That's something that we are going to address in the in the future. Um, the second part of it is creating market access for the investors who are going to come into the country, uh, especially our largest trading partners, China, Japan, Europe, uh, Europe and US. We need to at least get uh, five trade agreements, if ideally free trade agreements, if not at least trade agreements, to be able to create market access uh, for, for, for the investors who are going to come and set up in the country. And of course, the Indian end-to-end -end investor facilitation, not, not just for investors who are looking to export, but also who are looking to engage in a large scale infrastructure project this country could offer, uh, given the kind of the inflection point of GDP that we are we are. And overall, I think what it should crystallize is to improve ease of doing business through streamlined processes and digitalizations. For this, there is a whole set of efforts being driven by both the treasury and UI together also with the ICTA, uh, which is the which is entrusted in terms of digitizing the government processes. So with all these, we, we hope to see the ease of doing business rankings to go up in, uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, hopefully, my ambition is to get it up to the top 50 uh, in, in five to six years. Um, in, in terms of the investment export diversification, which is very critical, uh, we have identified five rest verticals. The reason for identification of these verticals are twofold. One is that we need to have certain verticals which will bring the build the capabilities required for the country or required for the future. Secondly, these verticals also need to ensure there's inclusive growth when a country goes through rapid economic growth or doubling their GDP from 4,000 to about 8,000 GDP per capita. 
Because otherwise, we'll have a huge gap between haves and have nots, and it will create social unrest uh, at, a, at a future date. So, in that in that regard, uh, ICT manufacturing mostly around rubber based, value added apparel, and pharma, electronic equipment are few industries which we have prioritized. There's agri and fisheries, of course, Sri Lanka being an island, having a large sort of, land, sort of sea space as our exclusive economic zone. We have really not taken the full benefit of the fisheries capability, the fisheries resources we have. And of course, being a, a tourist destination, um, uh, hospitals and infrastructure, uh, hospitals is a key part. And then, of course, infrastructure is where the country is. You would require significant investments in the infrastructure, whether it's roads, whether it is hospitals, whether it's schools, whether it is uh, rapid transit networks, airports, and so on and so forth. So that needs to come into as well. To, to all that, uh, to underpin all that, one of the key requirements we need is the, the, the workforce. Now, Sri Lanka has been one of the few countries uh, in the region who has free uh, education up to tertiary level and even uh, at the university level for, few, uh, for a selected group of people. We are looking at expanding the capacity or the output uh, from, from the university system, whether it is government or through public, uh, private partnership, to create the talent pool which we require to bring these industry workers to um, where we aspire them to be. So for example, IT uh, graduates, uh, we have about 1,000 to 2,000 today. We're looking to expand it up to 25,000. So in engineering science graduate, similar amount. Uh, agriculture, because we focus on the agri and being self-sustained, uh, sustaining certain product groups. We need more people focus on agriculture. And second, and, and not to leave out the people who do not get to the universities, that the vocational training has to be wrapped up. So there is a big uh, partnership that's going through, uh, going in between UI and VTA to reskill even the current workforce uh, in the factories in an event when the in the event if the person is. Uh, left without a job. Uh, then two other things that we are pushing forward is to establish a structured visa program to uh, get the get the uh, the talent we required into the country where we don't have uh, local talent. It's like what Singapore has done in terms of building certain trust sectors and of course creating a national fund by the government to make sure that they incentivize and pay for upskilling in certain certain types of workforce that we require in the future. And of course, one of the things that we're consistently doing is uh, creating uh, opportunities for high level participation. One good example is uh, one of the newest zones that we're building, we're actually building on the east side of the country, where in uh, Batiklo, where the industrialization is much low, the labor participation is quite, quite low, and of course, the, uh, uh, the amount of people uh, without jobs are much higher compared to the national average. So we are trying to move the industries um, to those regions. Uh, I'll just go through this quickly. I think one of the things that we are trying to do is like really with the elevation of the OI to be a, to play in the national level, just like what EDB is in Singapore. Uh, we are looking to broaden the scope of the OI and also the powers vested within the OI to give the national direction and also to be able to facilitate the investors end to end. Uh, we are working with government and institutions to look at new, uh, introducing new investment laws. Uh, you would see some of these changes coming through in the Secretary and Exchange Act that's going to come through, uh, the, the, uh, the Port City Law that's going to come through around the financial institution and so on and so forth, but also to make sure that the, any type of investors are protected uh, within, the, within the country uh, when they come, come to invest. And of course, some of the things around the land acquisition and, and uh, land development, which is critical especially when you're looking at large scale uh, infrastructure projects that needs to come in for the country. And of course, the labor laws. This is, of course, a much debated point in, in, in Sri Lanka. Of course, having the stronger labor laws has created an uh, export destination, which has the highest com uh, compliance in the world, especially if you look at apparel. Uh, Sri Lanka has the highest compliance uh, anywhere, any other, compared to any other apparel export destination. But also it creates the inflexibility in terms of being able to flex the labor force as they require. Of course, we can find creative opportunities and create ways within the legal framework to be able to find uh, a win-win for both the employers and employees. Uh, in terms of the regulatory point of view, uh, introduction of a simple and stable tax structure, and I think the government has, uh, even before COVID, um, 
shown their willingness to move towards this in terms of the tax cuts that was introduced in January, uh, bringing down whether it's personal income taxes, the corporate taxes, and so on and so forth. And I think the budget will be the direction for everyone in terms of how this will be maintained over the years to come. And uh, it's, there's an importance of carefully crafted uh, sector specific uh, incentives, for example, um, ICT, agriculture, and so on and so forth, still do uh, enjoy zero uh, corporate income tax in, in the country. Uh, in terms of uh, to drive these cross sectors, what are we doing? So we are trying to build five large industrial zones, specific world class zones, uh, one around the fabric uh, manufacturing in Erawu, we talked, we talked about on the east of the country, the pharmaceutical zone, a state of the art uh, 400 hectare pharmaceutical zone in uh, next to the Humbaguru port. Uh, there's a rubber um, processing zone spe specialized for rubber. So Sri Lanka is the um, solid tire capital of the world, accounting for 20 to 25 to 30% of the, the global output for agriculture based uh, solid tires. So we are looking at the double, we are looking to double that. So the advantage of such industry doubling is the entire ecosystem comes along with it, whether it is the, the rubber growers, the tappers, the landowners, the, 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 the sheet rubber makers or the processors, and of course, then the rubber manufacturers. So we wanna to try to bring the whole economy together. And then of course, the agri and the agriculture part. To underpin all these, um, I'm sure you have seen uh, many things written about um, some, of the, uh, some of the infrastructure uh, requirements of the country, whether it is light rail, whether it is central uh, expressways, whether it's highways, rapid transit, the airports, these are all needed as the country uh, looks to double their GDP in the next 10 years, I would say post COVID. So there's a quite a bit of part needs to play by DOI in terms of structuring these uh, while managing the balance of the challenges of the, country, the government's facing and also without uh, reducing the burden of uh, the government needs to borrow to spend for these infrastructure projects. Uh, so just to briefly touch on, I think the way that we have reorganized uh, the OI as well is to give direction for the, the, the country to say which cross sectors we should prioritize. Uh, then of course, look at where should we bring in the critical and marquee investments to bring that particular sector up. Uh, we have worked quite collaboratively with multiple um, agencies embassies and also the existing investors and have been reaching out to about 500 investors to try to get them to come and invest in the country with a with where we are we are very sure that we have a compelling value proposition compared to any other country uh, in the region and we are encouraging them to consider sri lanka actively and uh, make sri lanka a, a viable or a vibrant investment destination uh, if you look at the this year even through covid uh, while the actual FDI, which is the money being put on the ground, has slowed, DOI has been able to secure a very wide, many, uh, a strong pipeline, which will turn into projects uh, by next year, uh, which is, I would say, a testament to the, the policies set by the government and also the, the proactive things uh, being done to create uh, increased Sri Lanka's economic climate. Uh, in terms of sectors uh, that have been prioritized, um, uh, I'm not going in detail, but I'll just touch on very quickly. Uh, there are five sec areas that uh, focus uh, from, our country, from us as well as the country. In the manufacturing, there are three aspects, three areas which we have priority focus, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the manufacturing is discouraged or not looked into. One is pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical is looked at in two, two, two aspects. One is as Sri Lanka, uh, as a country, we spend close to about 600 to 800, 600, 700 million dollars uh, on pharmaceutical products. We do have a certain amount of localization of pharma products in the country, but we can produce more pharma products in the country to supply for the local government and the, the local health sector, as well as to export. This will enable us to create a new industry vertical, new capabilities in the country, uh, in terms of the workforce. So that's one of the reasons why pharma is actively promoting our course and it's a sector that has to be orchestrated to be able to make sure that Sri Lanka is set, com uh, 
compared to and competitively uh, compared to India, Bangladesh, and other countries. Of course, high value added apparel, as you all saw, that uh, apparel is a large export sector, which is about close to about $6 billion. But unfortunately, today we import about two and a half to $3 billion worth of apparel with some of these basic apparels and high end apparels, which we can manufacture in the country. So that's one of the zones that we've been built up. And electronics and electricals. If you look at the mineral wealth that Sri Lanka processes in this country, whether it is uh, graphite, some of the best graphite in the world, graphene technologies, uh, poly polysilicon, uh, and all the mineral sands, this is a segment I would say underrated compared to the capabilities and the product that we have you know, for in this country, and something that we can definitely push through. Uh, ICT, meaning some of the uh, examples to say London Stock Exchange runs on Sri Lankan software and of course the London Stock Exchange came and bought that company over uh, after a few years. Some of the companies in Sri Lanka, the products runs and powers most, some of the theme park, most of the largest theme parks, airlines uh, and cruise ships and so on and so forth. In terms of uh, our island point of view, we really sit rightly at the island, being the island of ingenuity when it comes to IT and technology. But uh, number of companies being in Sri Lanka, I think this is a sector we can double, easily create from 1.2 billion to $3 billion vertical going forward. Well, hospitals and tourism, we all hope for, uh, for a day that COVID goes away and we all can get back on a plane soon. Uh, in that regard, uh, I think hospitals and tourism is an area that uh, we look to pioneer and grow. We played, came close to about 3 million uh, uh, in terms, 3 billion in terms of receipts and we're we had plans to take it up to about 10 billion. We, we would see in another 10 years uh, to go up to at least 7 billion, uh, given the slump that we see in uh, COVID. Uh, agriculture and food processing it are two, two areas that uh, we really need to push forward. Uh, rubber and agri processing and fisheries are the three areas that we have put forward, and of course, the infrastructure, uh, which I will not go into details. So, just to sum up, like I think uh, the, the overall plan that which I present to you is setting the foundation that is required. For it. So though it is, it sounds like there's a few quick things that need to be fixed. These are uh, uh, Dr. Palit and uh, the, the experts would agree. These are some of the deep rooted problems that needs to fix, to be fixed with policy changes and you require a great amount of trust to make the policy changes happen. So in terms of BOI's point of view, our objective for this year and the next year to make sure that this foundation is set properly, the country can really uh, unleash and achieve the growth ambition that it set forward uh, in terms of doubling its GDP uh, in the next 10 years. So with that, I would uh, conclude my initial few words and uh, we'll open up uh, Dr. Palit and the team for questions and uh, Q&A. Sanjay, thank you. I think that was, uh an outstanding presentation. Uh, it was minute, it was nuanced, it touched upon all the specifics and uh, you covered a great amount of ground in terms of laying out the, the landscape as to why the investment uh, attraction has to be a top macroeconomic priority for the country at this point in time and has to be practically one of the cornerstones of the economic revival strategy. I think that was very enlightening. Uh, I wanted to discuss with you a few salient points and you, you have had the advantage of uh, taking this broad canvas view of the region. You know the region quite well. Uh, you know, Sanjay, I just wanted to start with the reflections that are coming out of South Asia as a region uh, from a large number of agencies of the world, including primarily the Asian Development Bank, the IMF, as well as the World Bank. And we, we are all aware of the uh, hits that countries and regions are taking as a result of COVID-19. South Asia is projected to be one of the worst affected in terms of uh, the decline in growth, the GDP contraction for the region, and while we are observing uh, North Asia and East Asia beginning to turn around, primarily because of uh, a rebound in China, uh, the South Asian prospects appear to be quite low. Now, this is where, when we look at uh, Sri Lanka as a country, we see an in interesting dichotomy. 
Sri Lanka has performed much, much better than the bigger economies of the region as far as managing the COVID-19 is concerned. And certainly not just India, but even if compared with Bangladesh and Pakistan, Sri Lanka's performance has been commendable in so far as tackling COVID-19 is concerned. But the other side to that is that notwithstanding that performance, the economic deceleration for Sri Lanka, the one that has been projected by various agencies, is quite sharp, quite sharp. And in fact, India, Sri Lanka, and Maldives are widely pitched to be the three economies in South Asia which are going to suffer the deepest of the contractions in the region compared with uh, Bangladesh and Nepal. Now, I wanted to have an outline of your perceptions on what do you think lies ahead for the South Asian region? I think following that outline, I'd love to come back to you with a few more specific questions on Sri Lanka and the investment prospects. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, that, thanks, Doctor Pad. I think it's a very interesting question. I would say the the answer would have been much different if it was three weeks or four weeks ago. I would say, uh, given where we were, uh, I think if you look at when COVID hit, the different countries took a different approach. Uh, I would say when the first wave came in March, Sri Lanka perhaps went was the first country to go for a full lockdown. Um, introduced a mechanism of having, uh, I would say, uh, quarantine centers in this part of the world, and actually managed to eradicate COVID, I would say, not eradicate, to take COVID under control and take COVID away from communal transmission around uh, late April. So there were two, right? And then from then onwards, in the second wave that which we hit recently, we had a, a couple of months of uh, uh, of course, we'd had a few scares and uh, small clusters putting up, but generally we had COVID free. Along with that, the economic policy that took hold had created till, I would say, middle of October, beginning of October, we were expected to have a positive uh, GDP growth or zero GDP growth or a slightly positive GDP growth. So this is was a much better picture than what uh, economists and all that have just, uh, put forward for Sri Lanka, where they say somewhere between zero to four percent negative, uh, India being the hardest, and then of course Mal and it's, of course uh, uh, Maldives being followed afterwards, and of course Bangladesh being the only country in South Asia perhaps having some sort of a positive. Growth. Now till October, till the second wave, I think it's too early for us to call whether it will be negative one or negative two, but if you look at first week of October, our projection for the year looks like it was 0% GDP growth or a little bit higher. There were a couple of things that underpinned this performance. One is the, the quick action that Sri Lanka took during the first outbreak in March and how uh, and the, 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 the military, the medical community, the government infrastructure, uh, the police and everyone, and of course the, the citizens came together uh, to, to address the issue. Secondly, making sure our export businesses would continue. Um, so even though we closed around 19th of March, if I remember right, by, of course we had our new year, which is uh, middle of April. Uh, anyway, there's a little bit of a lull period, but just before even new year, we started opening our countries while COVID being ramped up. Uh, stamped out. And by mid May, when COVID was hitting hard, uh, countries like Bangladesh, India, and so on and so forth, Sri Lanka was pretty much COVID free, and our manufacturing was ramped up to the pre COVID levels. And we had three to four months of uh, billion dollar exports on month on month, which I would think is, uh, is not a runway that we have sustained for some time. So we stamped out COVID quickly. We got our economic engine in terms of the exports going. Thirdly, it was the policies that the government took in trying to uh, limit certain amount of imports. Now, uh, there were certain bans introduced in terms of new vehicles imports, or there was a temporary ban of new vehicles imports. There was a restriction of certain amount of imports. Uh, this was created 
to make sure that the, the fiscal policy is sound. Right now. Dr. Pali, the other thing is like, among all these things, the country had sovereign obligations to pay off some of the debt. And that's one of the things that the central bank and the treasury has and the government have been saying repeatedly that we would not default any of the debt and we would pay it as we planned. And I think despite some of the uh, downgrades, which I think is a little premature, uh, if you think the, 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 the country's performance point of view, uh, we have honored the debt. And the plans are there to honor the debt for the next couple of years. Uh, so if you take all these things together, I, it would be too early for me to call that you have such a sharp decline in the GDP uh, as Economist magazine had predicted very recently. Because if you look at even now, we do have a COVID outbreak. And it did outbreak in one of the regions where most of our UI or, or export oriented countries are there. Yes, the, because of the health uh, aspects, there are some factories, a few factories have been shut down, some of them, them are operating at a lower, lower, lower capacity. But the rest, the, but the primary focus has been to enable and quickly take out and separate people from COVID and don't have COVID to get these industries run. So if that's a primary aspect of it, so then we would expect still room for economic recovery. Uh, and if we had these three months without any runs, we would have had probably record growth in terms of exports and would have had a positive GDP growth more likely. But even if it's said and done, I think we still would come out much stronger than uh, what was predicted. And the second part of it is the composition of the economy. Uh, we do not have a large real estate se sector like what India does have. And because of that, the impact of the GDP was much less. Uh, the remittances from the foreign employer continued and it's actually has continued just like last year, despite uh, some of the foreign employers have losing jobs and whatnot. So tourism dollars went away. Of course, that too is uh, one big hit. But of course, on the other hand, we had some reprieve from having uh, cheap oil prices and all that. So taking all these in together, I think there was a much better cohesive management of the economy, where Sri Lanka came out top compared to the, the, the rest of the, uh, the countries. I think uh, we need to think about how we uh, move forward. And I think with the policies and getting COVID under control, we should be able to see a positive economy for the next year. Thank you, Sanjay, for that uh, very detailed explanation. And I think I agree with you. I think all the projections that we are getting to see at this point in time coming out of the international agencies are uh, very short term in that respect. They're also very static in their scope. And the COVID-19 situation is unfolding very rapidly. I mean, we are yeah. passing through peaks and troughs and crests and plateaus, all kinds of adjectives are being brought in, all kinds of alphabets are being used to describe the recoveries that will take shape in various economies and regions of the world. Yeah. So yes, we need to uh, watch out for how specific uh, economies are behaving. And I, I, I think I agree with you, the Sri Lankan government's response has been quite spot on and I think has been quite preemptive on the entire, entire developments. I'll come back to you with a couple of queries of mine, but before that, let me uh, turn to the chat board. You might be uh, sure. seeing some of the questions that are being posted on the chat forum. And uh, the first of these is from one board member of the Institute of South Asian Studies, Mr. Girija Pandey, a veteran in so far as the IT industry is concerned. Yes. Uh, Mr. Pandey asks that uh, there are uh, cost increases that are happening in India as far as the IT operations are concerned. And are there specific plans that the Sri Lankan government agencies or you, for example, might be having at this stage? to attract the major Indian IT giants to invest in Sri Lanka. And, and he also wants to know about the EODB, the ease of doing business rank that Sri Lanka has at this stage. Yeah, I think Mr. Pandey, uh, to answer Mr. Pandey, uh, Dr. Pandey's question, I would say two parts. I'll give you one example. Uh, recently, uh, HCL came and signed up with us to set up a, 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 I would say, disaster recovery center in Sri Lanka. This was in early March. And as they went and tried to recruit the people, they found that the Sri Lankan talent pool uh, was 
ranked much higher in terms of the capability than in terms of the uh, IQ level or maturity that they were measuring compared to the, the rest of the region that they were looking at. So by the time they were establishing the location, uh, they had already expanded to 500 people. And by the time September, when the, the prime minister, myself and our chairman, we inaugurated the, the, uh, the establishment with uh, 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 HCL, they had given a commitment to increase the number of uh, staff in Sri Lanka up to 5,000 in the next three to five years. Now that's kind of a, like a rapid uh, growth we have seen, a, a commitment a company in India has given to Sri Lanka, looking at the quality of talent pool and so on and so forth. So I would look at and encourage many of the other the, the Indian companies to come and really look at Sri Lanka because of the talent pool that they have, because of the education cost, uh, because of the, uh, the preemptive uh, aspects that they're putting in to build the talent pool that is required for these companies to come in. It is zero taxation for, for, for those investing coming. I think ease of doing business, yes, it is. We, we, uh, we rank uh, uh, more, much higher than, uh, much above than uh, India, where India has moved much ahead. But I think that's where BOI plays an active role. We do play uh, and create that ease of doing business in the country where the, the rank or the ranking of ease of doing business looks at more as a country as a whole, but as if the industry moves through BOI, we provide that facilitation to make sure that um, you've been treated and taken care of and provided all the necessary requirements to set up the companies for the country. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, I wanted to uh, actually get your opinion on Another set of uh, developments that are happening around us, around Singapore, around Sri Lanka, in the entire Indian Ocean, in the Pacific Asian yeah. development region, we are, we are getting to see a significant reorganization among regional supply chains. And there are a group of opinions, a block of countries working together to see that if supply chain disruptions can be minimized, and uh, these primarily arose out of the first round of disruptions that happened in China when the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. And there were problems of sourcing that were encountered by vendors at different stages. And subsequently, there has been this whole talk of making supply chains more resilient. And uh, from, a, from a lead manager's perspective to diversify the risks as much as possible. So which might actually end up resulting in a spatial production pattern in the region where there is much greater diversification, much greater horizontality across the region in terms of location of specific parts of supply chains. Now, in many respects, uh, Sri Lanka, as you mentioned right at the beginning of your talk, and as we all know, uh, historically the most open economy of the region in the Indian yeah. Ocean region. I think I, I wouldn't be wrong in saying that. And today, Sri Lanka is kind of poised at a very interesting juncture and trying to take a constructive, at the same time, aggressive attitude towards attracting foreign investment. Much of it is supposed to be export oriented. Do you see Sri Lanka benefiting from this reorganization that is happening in these supply chains in the region? And might that be a possibility that uh, from the Board of Investment you might have factored in when you looked at the entire strategy of recasting the foreign investment strategy for Sri Lanka. Yeah, Dr. Pal, I think that was one of the key thrusts that we looked at. And I think the, the, the whole COVID and before COVID also some of the geopolitical tensions around trade uh, had um, opposed uh, many of the companies to diversify their supply chain. And I think then the COVID coming on top of it, really the disruption that they saw, whether it be with China, whether it be so with Bangladesh and Apparel, or some of the pharmaceutical challenges that they faced with India, so and so forth, they, they really saw the need to have a diversified and a resilient supply chain than a low-cost sourcing, just focus on local sourcing. So we saw most of the critical components uh, say, for example, pharmaceutical. So that was one of the uh, one of the reasons we also focus on pharma and the um, because 
if you look at natural point of view, Sri Lanka is perhaps three, four, five years too early for a farmer. So, but if you look at the geopolitical and, and also the supply chain realignment, point, one is most of the farmer companies in Europe are they are farmer companies that have full capacity. Uh, there's a large concentration between uh, in China for API, 70% of API roughly to work in China, the rest of in India. Generics are concentrated mostly for FDA to reside in India or some other like other. So then the countries look at it and say that look, there is a country risk in terms of supply chain point. So then, of course, a Sri Lanka, a country that managed COVID at that point, uh, feels more quite well in terms of the right policies, in terms of the, the, the and if you get the right investment climate and infrastructure. Then it becomes a natural advantage or location for investment to come into the world. And then, of course, being the IPs, uh, being centered at the uh, Indian Ocean, getting the whole of East Africa, Europe because of connectivity, uh, South Asia because they are one of the countries that deal or, or trade with all the countries freely without any challenges, and also for Singapore and Indonesia and so forth. So, all of these things are taken into some of the, some of the sectors that we're so pharma being one of those sectors. Uh, then electronics is a similar sector. Because for two reasons. One is the concentration of electronic manufacturing and also the change in the electronic manufacturing, type of electronic product. So there's a lot of IoT, uh, there is on-chip programming that needs to come in. There's uh, internet of things, there's more aware solutions that comes in. There's going to be more on the tracking side of things. The advancements that you're talking about, making in solar and so on and so forth, demand for polysilicon, polycarbonate, polysilicon. Uh, then if you look at the minerals point of view, so Sri Lanka can be that high-end manufacturing for those kind. And the current factories need to be retooled anyway, might as well move to a place and start it fresh with all the incentives and everything that is on offer. So when we looked at our strategy and when it was cross sectors, we looked at the geopolitical change shift of production and how we could capture that. And so was for the every part of it. And some of the tensions that uh, the, the, the Western countries have, have with China on certain cotton and certain uh, fabric point of view, to have another, another location uh, for fabric sourcing in the region could not come at a better time. So that's why we focus on those verticals. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. In fact, uh, in connection to that, I wanted to uh, take you into another question which has been shared on our uh, chat forum with respect to infrastructure, which you might sure. have had an opportunity to look at. Now, let me pick up the context of this question and position yeah. it to you this way, that uh, Sri Lanka, of course, uh, when it looks out to engage with foreign investors and plug itself deeper into regional and global supply chains, Logistics become extremely important. Uh, infrastructure connectivity with the rest of the world becomes extremely important. But what also probably becomes equally important is to get the people to fund those. And I think today there is this bigger, bigger question that uh, you know investors with deep pockets are by and large cautious in terms of the areas where they're Way to put their funds in, uh, generally a bit reticent in terms of the long-term risk return payoffs which they are envisaging from these projects. Now, when it comes to Sri Lanka, could you share with us some, some ideas, some insights, some thoughts about how the POI is looking at the infrastructure development policies in the country and particularly as far as attracting private investment they do these sectors are concerned? Are you looking at public-private partnership possibilities or are you looking at some other forms of contractual uh, agreements? It, it would be great to know from you. Sure. I think to set a back, back, backdrop, I think, look, when a country goes through 4,000 GDP to about 6,000, 8,000, infrastructure or infrastructure part of GDP typically tends to have gone to 15 So it's a huge uh, for huge opportunity that this country present to any investor. Now that infrastructure can be brought in, broken down into multiple things, whether it could be housing, hotels, and that sort of infrastructure, or, or right, 
or you have the road networks, um, the railways, the ports, and so on and so forth. So I would keep the private infrastructure out because that's a professional arrangement that we have invested. We would have the, the pros and cons and the invest. I think where the, the most important part of it is, is the, the national infrastructure that needs to come. Um, and I think you know, if you take a comparison of countries like say, India and China point of view, the having the road networks, having the rail works do spur the growth. So Sri Lanka also needs to get that right. So that's the first part. The second part of it is if you look at the balance of payments in terms of um, the debt carry capacity point of view, uh, the treasury do face a challenge at this point in terms of carrying additional foreign borrowings to, to fast track some of these infrastructure. And uh, for, for these reasons, some of these infrastructure projects has to be deprived at this point. But if an investor comes in, uh, then I think the question is we are open to the market. There are multiple models you can, you can look at a few public transfer, you can look at a private public partnership point of view, though you can have a deferred mechanism where the infrastructure reverts back to the, the government books and where the loans are paid off. Now that could be if it is five, six, seven, ten years down the line, the economic growth of the country would have facilitated the higher collection of um, what we call the uh, tax revenues. At that time, servicing more debt is not the issue. So, so what I'm trying to say is like when it comes to public infrastructure, the the preference from the government is to not to borrow on their books, but be able to facilitate to any other mechanism, whether it be lot of credit transfer, whether it is a deferred uh, deferred loan where you operate the asset, but the loan takes on by the, the government at later on, like for example, for rail projects we have seen in certain countries do, or whether it is a a public private partnership where the government get carrying or the cash outflow is minimized. So not all infrastructure falls into these categories and becomes viable. Then we need to look at creative financing mechanisms to do that. Whether you support or facilitate through additional infrastructure that we give we give companies to develop, thereby we are paying off the, the borrowings to additional economic activities that they take on. So, there, so in BOI point of view, and uh, taking Mr. Ratnayaka, who I am on case here, the chairman of BOI, and myself coming from uh, this in the past, uh, looking at the, the many and transactions, so we can really think about how you do that uh, within the within the government purviews, uh, try to encourage investment in infrastructure and and manage a win win. And one of the other things that we are also trying to do uh, with the government is to bring the infrastructure cost down. So today, Sri Lanka, one of the, the impediments that we have with our infrastructure cost is one of the highest in the region. Uh, whether it comes to cement, whether it comes to steel, whether it comes to the uh, aggregates and so on and so forth. So if you bring that to the, the, the regional aggregators, uh, the companies could have enough returns uh, to, to, to meet their risk return, uh, or they say the uh, the matrix so that they could attract, they could get a good uh, return without getting much of the government attention. That's all the, the energy models that typically people tend to look at in this part of the world. So, Jay, that uh, was again uh, very insightful, and I'm conscious of the fact that we do not have uh, too much longer to go in retaining you with us. But within the short time uh, that we have, and in order to make the best use of those, I wanted to check two specific questions with you. The first of these is, is a follow-up from the question that uh, you just elaborated on infrastructure and the fact that, you know, uh, state funding or funding of that character is extremely important when it comes to accelerating investment. Now, uh, there, there's this view that funding from China has been very deep and widespread in Sri Lanka in so far as uh, infrastructure assets are concerned, but probably it is also important for Sri Lanka to diversify the sources of funding. So is there a thought in so far as infrastructure funding is concerned to approach countries like the United States of America or Japan in this regard to explore the possibility of direct donor funding through specific schemes related to infrastructure. 
So Dr. Bhavan, there's two parts of it. One is the, the donor-based funding. And of course, uh, uh, Professor Admiral Kalamidi also talked about that we have a non-alliance uh, economic policy in terms of when you look at the country from the table, it's a country first and they're trying to develop the economy. And anyone who's willing, looking to participate, they're, they're, they're encouraging everyone with open arms. Uh, one is the donor funding. Yes, we are open for any type of uh, uh, for any country to come and engage in that discussion. The second part of these all these large scale large scale infrastructure projects. Uh, what we are looking to put is for open tender and do it in a transparent way for any company, whether it is Chinese or whether it is somebody else, to be able to participate. I think the optics sometimes defeats the purpose, defeats actually the big deal of something. Else. I'll just let you know one example I think. The latest tranche of money that was raised by Treasury was a public option. And it did go to the Chinese bank because they provided the best terms for the country. But the way you picked it, the way the most, the, 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 the way the reporting went up was it, oh, we get another loan from China. So some of the infrastructure project is also the same situation. So what we would do is in going forward, we will have as much as transparency, any project that comes up through the UI. And have an open open platform for anyone to come and invest, invest on. In that sense, let the best person get the project. So then Sri Lanka wins, and then the investor wins as well. So that is the way that I look at uh, addressing this issue. And in, in terms of alignment point of view, Sri Lanka first, and we are open to everyone to do business. In that's very, very heartening to know, um, Sanjay. In fact, I think uh, this mindset makes a great deal of difference to the perceptions of investors when it looks at uh, investment locations, potential yeah. investment locations. I think the outlook of the agencies in so far as uh, they are looking at getting investment from a good group of investors are concerned, that makes a great impression. The, Last question that I have for you uh, on today, Sanjay, is that you very rightly in your presentation alluded to the importance of increasing exports, obtaining market access. And I assume that uh, the character of the investments that you would look to come into Sri Lanka, given the relatively small size of its domestic economy, it would essentially be of an export-oriented variety. Uh, investments that would create the capacity and condition enabling Sri Lanka to diversify its export basket and uh, export to other countries of the region and the world. And in that regard, uh, we know that FTAs are very important, the free trade agreements. Now, this is why I wanted to check with you that Sri Lanka has uh, a few FTAs, though it, it has not had as robust an FTA engagement as probably Vietnam, the example that you share. But it does have FTAs, including one with Singapore. It, it has a preferential trade agreement with India, which it has been looking to upgrade for several years. It's yeah. at an advanced stage of FTA negotiations with China. At one stage, there was also the possibility yeah. of Sri Lanka looking seriously at the RCEP. Now, I wanted to check with you that, could you share with us some little bits of details or ideas about what exactly is Sri Lanka's current thought on engaging in FTAs. Yeah, Dr. Malik, I think you're absolutely right in terms of uh, having free trade agreements. We compared to a country like Vietnam, we really managed to get multiple free trade agreements in the past uh, couple of years. But if you look at like the the open for openness of countries which we export into. For the product group that we do, we do have certain uh, quite a bit of agreement uh, part of the country. Now, this is something I think the important thing is whether you define it as a free trade agreement, whether it is a trade agreement. What ultimately you need is a level playing field and a competitive market access to the country that you're converting. So the way the way that the DUI is engaging with the government for commerce and so on and so forth is to say that, well, if you are building an economy of this nature. In the future, you need to try to create an access for those companies who come in. So that it is the import taxes, the tariffs, and non-tariff barriers that these companies may end up forcing to make sure that we can create a pathway or, or a, a conduit for them. In that regard, 
um, there is an active dialogue uh, and uh, hello yeah yeah I'm with you. yeah so i think there's an active dialogue that uh, it's ongoing in terms of crafting uh, uh, the, the trade policy of the country uh, along with that the final free trade agreements we had uh, some of the free trade agreements or some of the trade agreements we had honestly and then we'll say it will see you are lopsided but we need to have an equitable uh, agreement for us to have access to the markets the same way that uh, we enabled other uh, the other countries to have access to our markets so i think we just need to have a reciprocal uh, trade agreement for us to continue to grow so that is critical uh, for us to get the high value added production or manufacturing into the country because that is what's needed it's not Meaning it's not the low value added item that we need. We need to create a core system where we can create more high value or more value addition. Yeah, I That's uh, very heartening to hear, Sanjay. That's also very uh, you know, lucid in terms of the priorities that you explained. I think as I uh, shared uh, with you before and as you further compounded in course of the thoughts that you shared with us. I think the possibilities that we have with us at this point in time are quite a number, quite a number in the sense that there is a general sense of despondency around us because of the difficulties and hardship that the COVID has created. But in a sense, there are also possibilities emerging out of the uh, quote-unquote disruption that is be being caused by COVID, particularly for an economy like Sri Lanka, which did actually go ahead with the general elections, a commendable feat, and has got around to very specific steps, including establishing the Board of Investment for turning around the economy, engaging uh, distinguished experts like you at the forefront of this economic recovery mechanism. Sanjay, uh, with that, I'm afraid we have come to the end of the session. I really, really want to express my very sincere thanks to you from the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, and also from the Pathfinder Foundation at Colombo for illuminating us with such a number of you know, great insights on uh, the Sri Lankan economic recovery plan and investment prospects are all about. Friends and colleagues, we have come to the end of this very engaging and interesting conversation, the second in the ISAS Pathfinder Foundation webinar series. We were speaking to Mr. Sanjay Mohatala, the Director General of the Board of Investment in Sri Lanka. I would take this opportunity to thank all of you for being with us here today. Apart from those who have joined us directly through the Zoom meeting link, as always, we have had a great number of people listening in through Facebook on which this event was being light screen. Thank you for your questions, enlightening and engaging as always. I want to very specially thank the Pathfinder Foundation for being such an able and meaningful collaborator. We are very happy to work with Pathfinder Foundation, particularly with you, Amira. You have really been a great source of support and we look forward to continuing this engagement. And finally, I would like to thank my ISAS colleagues, uh, Professor Raja Mohan, who unfortunately could not be with us here today. And along with him, he has always been the provider of ideas with respect to this particular structure of collaboration that we are taking forward. My colleagues, Yusuf, Jordan, Roshni, and Sitara for making this event a success. Thank you so much. Stay safe, stay connected, and please keep on visiting us whenever possible. And we hope to come back to you again very soon. A very good afternoon and evening to you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Sanjay.